My name is Leslie Scott and I'm the Scottish Officer for the Young Amy Sufferers Trust or Times Trust. We are a UK charity and we help children and young people with Emmy and their families. I thought I'd start tonight by giving a wee bit of background about GERFEC. Um, GERFEC is Getting It Right for Every Child and the approach itself has been around in Scotland for quite some time and over the years it's become threaded through all existing policy, practice, strategy and legislation affecting children, young people and families. It is the basis for all children's services and it's also used by practitioners in adult services who work with parents and carers and it was during the Highland Pathfinder trial of GERFIC that the named person was developed. Now as a policy GERFEC seemed to have universal support amongst practitioners, but disagreement did exist over implementation. A report in the Times Educational Supplement, the TESS, in 2012, stated that the government's push to give GERFEC statutory weight through the Children and Young People Scotland Bill, as it was at that time, was, quote, born out of frustration at the length of time it was taking to deliver GERFEC. Each of Scotland's 32 authorities were at different stages of implementation. Each had a different interpretation, and the change in culture across agencies, from education to health, social work, law enforcement, housing, and adult support services, was proving slow in some areas. Scotland, children in Scotland membership covers a wide select section from education authorities to teacher unions to the voluntary sector and in the same article they agreed that the government had sought to incorporate GERFEC as is into the children and young people bill because of frustration but they warned that this would not lead to, f to faster implementation. The primary schools heads union AHDS who in common with other organisations supported the principles of GERFEC voiced concerns about its practical implementation and warned of significant workload and resource implications. This is particularly interesting at this point in light of new recommendations that have been sent to all schools in Scotland on cutting classroom bureaucracy and the Education Secretary's recent statement that she does not want to, quote, she does not want teachers to be burdened with any more bureaucracy than they need to be. The national practice model is the toolkit at the heart of GERFEC and it poses a significant bureaucratic burden on those charged with measuring a child's well-being. It consists of three elements. First up is the well-being whale. This is made up of the eight Shinari indicators. Shinari standing for safe, healthy, achieving, nurtured, active, respected, responsible and included. The Children in Scotland organisation held intensive consultations with members and they identified a particular concern that the Shinari wellbeing indicators were not appropriate for incorporation into primary legislation, a view shared by the Law Society of Scotland and the Faculty of Advocates. Yet here we are with just that situation. Edinburgh University has helpfully developed 304 so-called outcome signifiers to provide more detail be behind each of these eight wellbeing indicators and these to, ass to assist practitioners when assessing a child's wellbeing. They state that the list is neither exhaustive nor prescriptive, however there's a very real danger that these 12 pages of descriptions will in fact be used as an ever-increasing checklist of what a child's wellbeing should look like particularly when the draft guidance that's currently out for consultation states that well-being can ad be adversely affected by any matter arising from any factor. <laughs> Second up is the national, uh, in the national practice model is the My World Triangle. And this is used to assist in the gathering of information on each and every child and all associated adults. This involves assessing the child and its wider family in order to gauge one, how the child or young person is growing and developing, two, what the child or young person needs from the people who look after him or her, and three, the impact of the child or young person's wider world of family, friends and community. Then we have the resilience vulnerability matrix. This is used to organise and analyse information collected in order to assess, for example, whether the child has good esteem and shows good attachment to their parents or carers. In conjunction with the national practice model, there is the national risk framework. This provides practitioners with a three-staged approach to risk. 
Risk indicator sheet, the, the first stage, uh, risk indicator sheets assist in providing additional information through assessing risk and the impact that risk factors may have on the safety and well-being of the child. There are three sets of risk indicators, as you can see. There's generic, matrix and resistance. And between them, they have 22 risk indicators listed. Practic practitioners are again told that uh, whilst comprehensive, they do not seek to be exhaustive. And they include being under five, illness within the extended family, experience of bereavement, parental resistance or limited engagement, the child being unwilling to disclose information, and the parent having a different perception of the problem. Stage two is risk analysis. This is a process of breaking down the complexity of a child and family circumstances into smaller parts. The information gathered is sorted, weighted in terms of its significance, and, quote, made sense of. The following tools are used to make sense of the information gathered. First up, you have the genogram. This is a visual tool used by practitioners which displays a person's family network and relationships. The child, I know you won't be able to make out the detail, but the child's at this end, and the extended family goes back from it. Next up, we have chronology. You have a simple chronology, and you have a complex chronology. This is a summary timeline of child and family circumstances, patterns of behavior, and trends in lifestyle, and it's meant to be every time an event happens, it gets recorded. Then you have an eco map, again a visual tool used to highlight relationships between a child, their family and their social network. There's a code, they use solid lines to indicate strong relationships, broken lines mean there's something not quite right there. But the child's in the middle and everybody fans out from the child. And then we have the cycle of change. This plots a parent a carer's potential for engagement with the whole risk identification assessment and management process. Practitioners are told that resistance to change may present through a family's aggression, their conditional compliance or refusal to cooperate, <coughs> missed appointments and other forms of avoidance, superficial engagement or cooperation. The third and final stage is risk management. This brings together the work done in stages one and two in order to make a judgment as to the child's well-being and whether a child's plan is required. At the end of the Gerfeck trial in Highland, nearly 8,000 children, that's one in five, had been judged as requiring targeted interventions and were put on a child's plan. Now, the draft guidance on the Children and Young People Act, currently open for consultation, has not been written with practitioners in mind, nor has it been written in a way that makes it accessible to most children, pe young people and parents. It is 111 pages aimed at informing those charged with implementing and operating the Act. This of course includes the implementation and operation of the named person provision, which is a universal provision. There is no opt-out, despite attempts by Liz Smith to have one included. The Minister for Children and Young People, Aileen Campbell's response was that it would result in too much bureaucracy. <laughs> she added, and I quote, if a child or young person does not wish to engage, they do not need to, unless there is more serious concern about the child which demands that services become involved. Now, two points arise from that statement. Firstly, the name prov person provision has lowered that threshold for intervention from risk of significant harm to where the named person has a worry or a concern against the Shinari wellbeing indicators. We feel this leaves significant decisions open to personal interpretation and bias on the part of the named person. Secondly, the claim that the child or parents do not have to engage is disingenuous. It fails to clarify the possible consequences of non-engagement. Remember, parental resistance is a risk indicator, as is a child unwilling to disclose information. Nor does it explain that the named person would still fulfill their statutory obligations regardless of engagement. At Times Trust, we see the devastating effects to families of erroneous child protection actions. We know families who, simply by seeking to withdraw from services offered, have found themselves subject to further interventions. We've advised 141 families up and down the UK facing suspicions or investigations over child protection issues, and to date, none of these families have been found to be at fault. 
Jane Colby is the Executive Director of Times Trust, and in her recent paper entitled False Allegations of Child Abuse in Cases of Childhood and Myalgic and Myelitis," she states, Parents of children suffering from ME are often faced with intrusive legal action. In some cases, the threat of legal action is to enforce school attendance instead of putting into place the children's entitlement to education in the home while they recover from a very serious illness. Parents can find themselves facing investigations for child abuse or neglect, or have their child forcibly confined to a psychiatric unit. Families appear to be facing an arbitrary, punitive, threatening and destructive state juggernaut. Jane's paper is important to our discussion here because it gives stark reality to what happens when those in authority make the wrong judgments. It highlights the imbalance of power. Those service providers responsible for the name person provision are the same state agencies who are already at serious variance with parents over how to best care for and educate young people with ME. But this just does not just affect families of children with ME. For the draft guidance makes it clear that while the views of both parents and children should be taken into account, there is no requirement for the named person to seek consent for their actions. There is an inbuilt imbalance within the named person provision over the weight given to the views and opinions of, pre of professionals against those of parents and families. The majority of calls to Times Trust advice line involve problems where parents' views over the type of support and how it should be provided differ from those of the professionals involved. But worryingly, the Scottish Government has stated within their guidance on measuring outcomes that linked to the healthy wellbeing indicator is that the child and young person, parents and carers are compliant with treatment for any illnesses, diseases, chronic conditions and impairments. Far from supporting families, compliant places a professional in control. It moves authority to the state, making the parent's opinion entirely secondary in the care and treatment of their own children. The Scottish Government, however, still insists that nothing in the legislation changes existing parental rights and responsibilities. But the current legislation makes it clear that it is the parent's responsibility to safeguard and promote their child's health, development and welfare, and to provide direction and guidance to their child. Aileen Campbell is on record as saying that, quote, we recognise that parents also have a role in raising their children. Under the name person legislation, state employees have now been granted statutory duties and responsibilities that rival the legal role of parents. This is not, as it has been claimed, simply the provision of a single point of contact available for families to dip in and out of as they wish. This is state mandated parenting which obligates a state employee to carry out statutory duties which are primarily the responsibility of the parents. We remain of the opinion that this is an unwarranted and oppressive intrusion into family life that the vast majority of families do not need or want and certainly did not ask for. Thank you.